Behind the Attic Wall by Sylvia Cassidy, Chapter 32. Miss Christabel Timothy John, I'm here, I came back, Maggie cried at the top of the stairs. I finally came back, except I can't stay very long. She couldn't stay at all, really. She had told her aunts she was going upstairs to the bathroom. They made her tell them wherever she went now, and she had turned the water on in the sink and let it run noisily while she, stro while she stole up to the attic. Here I am, she announced as she rounded the wardrobe. And guess what? I know who you are now. Uncle Morris told me. Well, he didn't tell me exactly, but I guessed. You're hey, she said, advancing into the room. Everything remained as she had left it when a week earlier her aunts had steered her across the floor and down the stairs. The streamers still hung in wide arcs along the walls and across the table edge and the fragments of the ballerina and across the table edge and the fragments of the ballerina made a little hill among the tea things. The two dolls lay sprawled on the floor precisely where they had fallen when Aunt Harriet and Aunt Lillian had entered the attic, and Juniper remained upside down in his basket. Hey, she repeated, it's only me. It's Maggie, you can get up now, and she waited for them to stir. Hey, she said after a while, my aunts have gone, and anyway we have to straighten up around here. The ballerina's all broken, and there are cake crumbs all over the table. Your chair's knocked over, Miss Christabel, and the streamer should come down. Hey, come on, the room stayed still. She stepped over to Miss Christabel's form and knelt beside it. It's time to get up, she said. It's time for tea, Miss Christabel. Are you okay? She laid back... She laid the back of her fingers across the doll's china che cheek as though testing for fever. Miss Christabel? She lifted the doll by its waist, but the china head only wobbled back and forth and the arms dangled uselessly at its side. Miss Christabel! The doll lay lifeless in her hands, and its painted smile was that of any doll on a shelf. Timothy John? She said, whirling now to the other doll. She picked him up and shook him too, but he made no reply and only swung aimlessly from her hand. <clears throat> while the new braided tie flapped back and forth like a loose banner in the wind. Her eyes moved to the table where Juniper lay among the cake crumbs and the ballerina fragments. His ear was missing again. Juniper? she called out, seizing his china form. Juniper! She took him as though he were a watch that refused to tick and held him to her ear, but no answer came. She sat back on her heels, resting her hands on her knees, and looking from one doll's body to the other, now and then she sighed. All at once she sat up. Hey, how about some tea, she said, getting to her feet. Some nice hot tea. That's what you need. Tea, with all those vapors and everything. That'll wake you up, and she carried the kettle to the stove. I'll get some bread and butter, too. You haven't eaten anything in a long time. That's what's the matter with you. You're weak. You, you haven't taken any nourishment, she said. You haven't taken any nourishment into your system. You're just, you're all, you're just skin and bones. Look at you. Here, I'll get it ready. I just have to pour it in the teapot and put the cozy on to keep it warm, and then I'll get the cups ready and everything, and the cream and sugar. You first, Miss Christabel. And in another moment, she was crouching over the woman doll's body, cradling the china head in her elbow and holding the teacup against the painted mouth. Here, she whispered. Drink it. It will wake you up. Just taste it. Then if you don't want to drink it, just one taste. Taste it. She shouted, but the doll lay limp in her arms, and Maggie finally let it roll onto the floor. You then, Timothy John, taste the tea. Just one taste. She held the empty cup to his face. Taste it. What's the matter with you? Make those noises you used to make when we had tea. Drink it, she shouted. Juniper, you drink it. And she shoved the teacup against the dog's china nose. Drink it. Make noises. Do something. And then she remembered the words of the two dolls when she had asked about bringing a visitor to the attic. But you must never do that. We must never be seen. Why not, she had asked, because something dreadful would happen, Timothy John had answered. Something like that, and Miss Christabel had silenced him. They had been seen by her two aunts who had discovered them after Maggie, in her haste to reach the birthday party, had forgotten to close behind her the closet door of the empty room. And now, with this, the dreadful thing that would happen, and now, was this the dreadful thing that would happen? Would they, could dolls die? They had, maybe they had just passed out or something from fright. Maybe they needed air. There was a poster in the school nurse's office that showed how to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Black and white drawings of a cartoon man with his mouth pressed against the cartoon face of an outstretched figure on a bench. A little balloon over the man's head contained the words, Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Maggie might try that. She'd breathe air into Miss Christabel's painted mouth. Until, in a sudden miracle, the china arms would twitch with life. 
The legs in their little black boots would slowly bend, and the doll would stand upright, like the cartoon figure in the last drawing of them on the poster. For a quick moment, Maggie put her lips to the doll's face and breathed deeply, but nothing happened, and she wiped the china taste from her mouth. It was a stupid idea anyway. Dolls didn't breathe. For a long while, she stood in the stillness of the room, doing nothing, staring at the two china bodies lying in their crumpled clothes on the floor, and at Juniper, standing like an ornament on the table. Her own breathing was the only sound to touch her ear. Inhale, two, three, four, she said in her head. Exhale, two, three, four. Hey, she finally said in a small whisper. Miss Christabel, your dress is all wrinkled, and very carefully she lifted the doll from the floor. Here, she said, let me straighten it out. And your new shawl, it's all crooked from when you fell. She laid the doll across her knee and smoothed out its clothes, and tidying its hair as well. And your hands are dusty, she added taking Miss Christabel's hard, cold, taking Miss Christabel's ha cold hand in her own and wiping it clear, and wiping it clean with the edge of her skirt. And you, Timothy John, she said, turning next to him, you need to be fixed, too. She rearranged his suit so that the sleeves were even and the pants unwrinkled, and she tugged at the ends of his braided tie. There, she said, curving the little gold watch chain around his stomach. You're all better. And now... And now it's time for everyone to come to the table. Come on, she propped both dolls in their chairs and installed Juniper in his basket on the floor. First, I have to clean up around here, she said. There's a whole bunch of broken pieces on the table, china and stuff, and I have to sweep it into the coal scuttle on top of the broken teacup. Remember the broken teacup, Miss Christabel? And then, changing her voice, she answered for the doll. Yes, I remember. Cream and sugar, Miss Christabel, she asked in her own voice, and then speaking for the doll. Thank you, I will. She held the empty cup to Miss Christabel's mouth and made sipping noises for her. Timothy John, will you have some tea? And she answered for him, too, in a low voice. Yes, please. Juniper, she placed the saucer against his nose under the table and made a little growl in her throat. Bread and butter, she asked the two, two dolls, and then, how lovely, she answered for them in their voices. And she made little nibbling noises as she held the wooden slices against her mouths, against their mouths. How wonderful of you to give us bread and butter, she said for Timothy John. It was just what we needed. We were faint from hunger. Maggie always gives us everything we need, she said for Miss Christabel. She is our caretaker. We are lucky to have had her, to have her here, answered Timothy, she answered for Timothy John. She should go soon. Her aunt would begin to wonder where she was, and soon they would knock on the door of the empty bathroom with the water, water running uselessly in the sink. They might follow her up here, now that they knew the way and then confine her to her room. They might throw away the dolls and all the doll things. They might send her away. She would go down in a minute, two minutes. First, though, she would mark the exact point where the doll's hands lay on the tablecloth. She had done something like that once with a dead turtle. It had been her roommate's turtle, and one day it had stopped moving, and a brown trickle had appeared on its shelf every time it was pressed. It's dead, Maggie had said, but her roommate said no, it was only napping. So they placed it on the window sill and outlined its nose with a pencil line. They made themselves stay away for five hours, and when they returned, the turtle's nose still rested like a stone on the pencil mark, and they buried him in the back garden. Maggie would try now for the dolls. With, would try now with the dolls. She would place their fingertips on the very edge of the bread slabs, with the teacups lined up perfectly at their wrists. Then she would stay away for a long time, longer than five hours, for a day, three days, a week. At the end of a week, she would come back, and if they hadn't moved, she would... What would she do? I have to go now, she said to the doll bodies propped in their chairs, and she placed the little newspaper in Timothy John's lap. Here, she said, you can read this while I'm gone. Ah, the newspaper, she said in Timothy John's voice. Too locked in a fire, it says. Pity. She made her voice high now. To what, I wonder? And now, a low voice from Timothy John. Gloves, maybe. Two gloves. No, it wasn't gloves, Timothy John, she said in her own voice. It was two people. Two people, and I even know their name. It was green. Very carefully, she straightened their lifeless forms at the tea table and lined up the fingertips up along the sides of the bread. They had this school downstairs, she continued, pushing Miss Christabel's chair in to keep her from toppling to one side. And they used to sleep in the empty room. Except it wasn't empty then. And one day, they went to the barn to burn a whole bunch of papers and stuff in the stove. And the whole barn burned down with them in it and their dog, too. They had a dog, and they all died together on the same day, May 14th. After a long silence, she spoke.
for each of the dolls. Imagine that, she said in Timothy John's low voice. Mercy, in Miss Christabel's high whisper. And that is the end of chapter 32.